just to give a bit of context, my current research project is on annotations in music books and printed music books of the 16th century. Um, many of those, of course, are student annotations. So there's many areas in which um, I overlap with a lot of what I've heard and what you're talking about. Um, and there would be a lot to say on those, although for those, the topic of books is usually a music book. And today I've turned it around and I'm looking at something else, which are non-music books, hence not my specialty, um, but which use music in their annotations through students. So this is the area I'm bringing to you and the context. Here we have a copy of the Structura Carminum, a treatise on Latin poetry written by the Silesian humanist Laurentius Cuvinos. This book was first published in 1469 in Krakow and in Leipzig very soon, and apparently attesting to its popularity, it was edited five further times in the next eight years. It was written, Covinus explains in the preface, for the students at the University of Krakow, and the analysis of annotations in various of the surviving copies suggests that it was also distributed and used more widely, particularly in German areas and particularly around Leipzig. The author, Laurentius Covinus, was lecturing in Krakow and is perhaps best known as a friend and teacher to Nicolaus Copernicus. He had been a student of the German humanist Konrad Zeltis, with whom he had evidently also shared the deep appreciation of and high regard for the teaching of Latin poetry. The Structura Carminum is evidently a didactic work, teaching the history and importance of poetry, and in particular, the basics of Latin meter. Much of this writing was, sometimes almost verbatim, later adapted in textbooks by other scholars. The copy we're looking at here is from the first edition, published in 1496, and is now held at the Germanische Nationalmuseum in Nuremberg. It was lightly annotated on some of the pages throughout the book. What interests me in particular are the further notes taken on the two folios at the end of the book. Here we find a summary of some of the aspects, some covered in the book, others not. These were either taken upon the reading of other material or during a taught lesson. Part of these notes is also a list of Latin vocabulary and the eagle-eyed amongst you will note the musical notes above the vocab vocables. They indicate two note length. The rectangular shape um, is the longer shape, indicating a brief, indicating a long note in music. The diamond shape is a semi-brief, a shorter sound. It noted that music, the brief would be double the value of the semi-brief. What we have here is of course not music. It's not the indication of an absent melody or the reminder of a song. What the musical notes are used for in this case are to give a quick visual indication of longer and shorter sounds. This is indeed a rather simple tool to explain one basic element of Latin meter. And it might be kind of almost obvious, but it seems to be the first time this is used, in, at least in the examples we know of. So you can see I've just circled some, it's above most of, of some of the words, but you can see this indications of shorter and longer note values through the two note shapes used. Further copies of Covinus' book were annotated with musical notes. Grandly MacDonald has drawn my attention to the copy now in the Ratio Bibliothek in Zwickau, which contains extensive annotations. They were made by one Georg Schiltel, who matriculated the University of Leipzig in 1496. From the annotations, we can gather that he attended the classes, classes of one Arnold Wurstfeld, and given the similarity of many annotations between multiple surviving copies, once again, we can assume that these reflect the comments made orally in the classroom or potentially a copy shared by the teacher. This is not the only instance in which musical notation was used at this time in students' annotations, particularly in relation to Latin poetry around this particular time. We also find them, for example, in copies of the Ars Versificandi, written by Covinus's teacher, Konrad Zeltis. It's a manual of Latin versification printed in Leipzig around 1486 for use in his classes at the university. It's the first humanistic treatise on poetry written north of the Alps, and it was Celsius' specific goal to bring the culture of classical Latin poetry over the Alps. There is evidence that multiple copies of this text were used in the same classroom, as they all contain evidence which seems to record verbal instructions. For example, the teacher evidently provided further sample words, which can then be found in multiple copies of the same words. 
In at least three of the surviving copies, early users have written musical notes next to the description of meter. Um, so here we have various things. If you look at the bottom, um, you have the different meters and you can see, actually this time they're not using briefs and semi-briefs, they're using semi-briefs and minims, but it has the same relation of one being the double length value of the other. Um, and up, on, up there, you find different words using different note values. It's not in, entirely consistent, but it, there's always a relationship between a shorter and a longer note value. I imagine that a teacher encouraged or suggested the use of notation to understand the long and short syllables. This appears to be one of the earliest uses of notation in this way. Going even further than just long and short note values, the user of a copy now held in Baltimore also indicates pitch. So here you find, this is on the front page, um, the explanation of the different meters with sample words, for example, Romulus in the first line, and above that, again, you find longer and shorter note values. But next to that, you also find the words fa, re, re, so an indication of pitch. Um, and all he's doing, or he or she, I guess he is doing, is indicating higher and lower pitch, um, a third apart. So in this case, it'd be fa, re, re, um, or he uses the same fa, fa for the next one, re, fa for short, long. So he equates the lower note with um, the shorter note value and the higher note with the longer note value. Um, Grantley has suggested this adds a level of complexity and thus suggests the first step towards linking Latin poetry with melodies. This is not a melody yet, but a sense of lower and higher in indications. A, de a development I will elaborate further in a moment. What these few examples here point to are a number of things. The start of a new phenomenon of using musical notation in the teaching of language, which would then secondly lead also to the new musical genre, the so-called humanist oath settings, in which music is specifically composed to suit the Latin meter in an attempt to help memorize classic poetry with the right metrical structure. More widely seen, it also indicates a crossover of teaching between language and music in the late 15th and early 16th century. I'll go through these in a bit more detail, and in particular, sort of what this develops to, what this hints at. First, the use of musical notation in the teaching of language more broadly. When both these books mentioned here at the beginning, that is Celtis and Covinos, were published, we do have no printed evidence of such a practice. However, these student notes seem to suggest that their teachers explained the pronunciation of Latin with note length. Were they written on the blackboard for them? Did the students know these shapes and were instructed orally to use them? Was there a visual aid to indicate those? So far, we're not aware that they had seen this use in, in printed books. But not long after these were published and annotated, we start to find printed examples of using notation in grammar books. So this is a part which is really new to musicology as well. And we were compiling a database of printed notation in German speaking areas when we came across a few of these grammar books. And I did some further digging and found more and more, so very much ongoing because surely they're more than the ones I know. The first examples we found are as expected from Latin grammar books. That's where we knew they might come up. In 1513 or 14, this book of Latin grammar um, and had grammatica was published. The third part contains explanations of quantities of syllables in different metric feet with the long and short syllables indicated by briefs and semi-briefs. So this is very much, um, although 15 years later, sort of the thing we've just seen as annotations. Hence, musical notation is here used to illustrate the rules of um, pronunciation and accentuation of the Latin language. Its author was the German humanist and theologian Johannes Cochleus. There we go, there's another example. That's Cochleus. He became a very outspoken opposition to Luther, as you might know. In fact, we find this practice also in Greek grammars. Um, this is Melanchthon's popular Institutiones Grammaticae, in which he also uses music to indicate the rhythm of the word. It's not the first textbook of its kind, of course, and um, also not in Germany. But what is different is that Melanchthon is very keen for the reader to understand, frequently addresses them directly, um, he'd originally written his grammar for young students he taught privately, and as part of his pedagogical tools, 
he uses music to explain the rise and fall of the Greek speech melody. This book became incredibly popular and at the 20 further editions until 1550 all retain the musical element, even though at the time many of the print printers would have not been used at all to print musical notation. Um, they're quite often done in woodcuts, as is the case here. In some other cases, they're actually set from type, um, but they always went through the trouble, or how much of a trouble that was, um, of including the musical examples in the reprints or in, in the later editions. We also find example of um, musical examples in the teaching of Hebrew. In 1515, the Quadratium Sapientia was published in Augsburg. It's a universal textbook covering basics of arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, geography, music, physics and metaphysics, um, often using diagrams. In the music section, you have the common sort of Guidonian hand and examples to explain the basics of music. That's quite common for a musical textbook of the time. But we also find the musical notation in the section on Hebrew grammar, right at the beginning of the book. Here we have notation again to explain um, the Hebrew language notated on two lines only, that's all it means. But again, we have two elements. We have short and long note values and we have higher and lower pitch. And of course, it needs to be read from right to left. The music is printed along with the text. The use of notation in teaching Hebrew is much extended in Johannes Reuchlin's De Accentibus et Orthographia, um, where actually he sets music into cantilenas into longer musical sections. After Reuchlin, at least one other Hebrew textbook was published in German-speaking areas that included notation, which was Sebastian Münster's Instructiones Grammatica. Once again, it includes cantillation formulae for Hebrew text within the range of a six that we're going much further up and down now using actual melodies, even set into harmony at times. Um, so we have no longer and shorter values, but also pitch ranges. What we see in these last two examples is the expansion of simply using note shapes to using melodies, even then harmonies in the teaching of language. This is most common once again in Latin poetry where entire poems were set to music which led to the development of a new separate genre, so-called humanist odes. What started arguably with the monophonic lines in Nietzsche's grammar, first published in the German speaking lands around 1485, later continues in grammar books, which frequently include also four part settings of Latin voice. So music set for four voices to sing together, the important bit being that they all move at the same rhythm at the same metric, uh, correct rhythm. Often simple note values are first used to explain the basics, which are then followed by four part settings of the poetry. Um, here is a simple four part setting, although that's not set very well, so you actually have to, to be able to read that you have to write because there's, they're not um, the sort of one after the other. It's a little bit difficult to read, but they become more sophisticated as we go on. The purpose of these odes is manifold, to provide in music the correct meter, to educate in applying such meter to poetry and to help memorize the poetry. It's very effective also for memorization purposes. And I had to sing um, in my undergrad days, which are longer gone than many people think, but I had to sing some of the innate as, as demonstration in, in ode settings. And I can still remember at least the first section very well. So there's a good, uh, and you remember them in the right magical rhythm. So it works, I think, at least from the great sample size of one. And these ode settings were then also published separately. They frequently appear for one or more voices, also in early Latin plays. Both these sets of publications show sort of a crossover um, of teaching methods between the teaching of music and languages. Let me briefly return to those annotated poetry books I mentioned at the opening, the Carmen Structura and Ars Vesficandi. These were annotated before any of these mentioned developments happened, or at least were, were appearing in print in the German speaking areas. So I do wonder how the connection was made in these very early stages between the poetry and the notational symbols. I've suggested earlier on that they would probably present oral instruction in a classroom or from a teacher. I wonder though whether it might have been necessary for the students to see such an example for them to understand a visual connection, potentially drawn on a board for them. In any case, this selected group of textbooks with their annotation suggest introduction of a new teaching method, the use of notation as a tool in lectures. This method would later become more formalized and the printed grammar books have shown, demonstrating an apparent overlap in the teaching of languages and music.
Here, here's a nicely set oat setting, a little bit better than the previous one. To conclude, here is another opening which comes at the end of Covino's Camina Struttura. It shows the use of Celtic's grid diagrams, um, as he sort of introduced, the use of notation to indicate long and short note values on the, on the right side, um, as we've quite often now seen, but also a first introduction of at least on three lines, sort of a melodic line. So bringing together quite a few of these aspects I've mentioned indicating that this was an emerging practice um, being used here by the students. All the examples I have shown and that I know of come from a rather small circle of humanists in central Germany around 1500 and some of the examples up to 1550. So I'm particularly curious to know whether there's other examples from other regions, other periods that um, other scholars are aware of. And I'd be interested to hear thoughts about the practical implications of how such an instruction might have taken place, how the explanation actually made it into their students' books. With that, I'd like to conclude the sort of formal part of the paper and move to the discussion. I'd only like to say, I don't think my French is good enough to respond in French or even understand. So if you could stick to German or English, I'd be particularly grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this wonderful uh, paper. Um, I, I was aware that it, it happened, this musical annotation, but not on such a systematic scale, let's say, in this uh, circle of, of German humanists. And it's also very interesting, of course, for our project on the so-called three sacred languages, because we have uh, three different languages on which this notation is, is applied. So that's that's very nice. And I would love to hear you sing the beginning of the, the Ennead, but let's uh, go to, to the questions first. I see that Ray has a question, please. Hi, um, this, was, <clears throat> this was really, really great. And, and I have only one question and, maybe, and one suggestion. <clears throat> uh, I want to say that I looked at quite a few English grammar books and materials and I never encountered such uh, notation system. So the question is basically, if you have any uh, idea, why would it be so local? How, uh, so is it such a German phenomenon? And if so, why? And why wouldn't it move to other areas? Or maybe it did. And, and then uh, one thing I, I have, uh, um, one of the only images that I know of a grammar school uh, that actually has um, something that seems like a, a blackboard is from Germany and it has musical notations on. So it's in print. And if you don't know this image, I'm happy to send you by email. Yeah. yeah. There's like a furious one as well, which has the sort of you mean a, an image of a, of a group sitting and someone ha having a blackboard and the musical notation on that? Is it's that like a, a classroom scene in which the schoolmaster, one schoolmaster is beating the child and yeah. the other, other children are looking. And it's one of the only, um, I, I was thinking about what he said about the requirement of some visual element to, and, and as, as far as I know, most English grammar school ones at least didn't have anything like a blackboard. Mm -hmm. And the German one, this woodcut is a German one. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. So on the, on the second point first, I'm also, I'm also interested in sort of blackboards and we find them a little bit in, I'm very specific, know a lot about the German context, unfortunately, but we do find them there also in the Gafurius and um, in quite a few of the musical treatises, which is what I usually work with. So music music textbooks and the, and the annotations in there. We have a few of those um, images and with music being taught, because I think to understand musical notation it needs to be some sort of music visual cue. I see that with my five-year-old learning music. It's in, interesting how much fixated you, you need to see what it means, that relationship of node values in particular. And there's also the Gafurios, um, which has a, a musical textbook, which has a blackboard in it. But it's particularly interesting to hear that it's such a local phenomenon. I'm not sure um, how it was used elsewhere and talking about local so you're saying in the English grammar they they don't appear I mean I've started from a corpus that was in Germany and a corpus that is very strongly centered around Celtis and to some extent I wonder whether that's the driving force behind this is Celtis's desire um, who and you know the the humanist odes these settings also very relatively localized I mean it spreads out there's some some uh, being composed in Vienna and there's some being composed in Krakow and there's, but it spreads in a sort of central European 
um, and it stops in the middle of the 16th century. So I think it is connected to a certain circle of people who have a strong desire of bringing these things together. Um, they also include musical settings in their plays, in the early um, sort of Latin plays from the early 16th century. I, I, yet, I have heard about a French grammar, a book of Greek grammar printed in France, which has music in it. I've ordered it in the British Library. It's been waiting for me for about six months. Um, so I, there might be other examples. And, and I wouldn't be surprised because we only knew about the Latin ones to start with, and then the Greek and the Hebrew came up. So I also wouldn't be surprised if it's not as local. But I do think there's certainly um, an element of, of personal connection of the circle around Celtis and, and students that have this desire of bridging the two. Thank you. Okay. Like, oh, okay. no, continue. Sorry. No, no, I was uh, going to call the next, but you, oh, you go ahead. Call yeah, I'm here as a chair, so you might as well use me. Uh, Jan is, is next up with the question. I'm not sure I was the first, but anyway, uh, two short questions. Do you think there is a, a sort of a bridge with uh, the Roman plays and which were staged again by humanists and how they would uh, deal with the choruses? Um, that part. And the second is, do you have any uh, affirmative um, uh, element somewhere that music instruments were used as well to learn young students to get this, this rhythm, uh, whatever? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, both, so on the second question, I actually just cut an illustration out of my presentation as not to overload it, where in one of the Ars Versificandi, a, a lute, or it looks very similar to Vijuela, is um, sort of, uh, I wish I could share it, but I know this takes too long to bring it up, but yeah, it's a little, uh, and it's sort of on the side, in the margin, um, sort of drawn. So the assumption is, yes, it was probably very much used, and we have a lot of indications from music textbooks that they were used. and. A little bit later, as we're getting into the 16th century, those musical manuals start to be printed and you, where people can actually teach themselves playing an instrument, especially plucked instruments. So it would be, if anything, a vihuela. And it's funny that exactly in an art specific candy, you have a, I mean, a, a tiny indication of that. And the Roman plays, yeah, I think. So again, we have Celtis and the Circle in Vienna um, who first staged the classical plays and then start writing their own. And it's also there that we have, we originally thought that this connection of metrics and music starts with those plays. Um, these were the first indications. I mean, the, the big one we know of are the old settings, but they're not printed until 1507. Um, and then earlier than that, 1501, you get the first place, which I've just published on last year because we thought that's early. And now we find these annotations, which seem to be even earlier. So again, uh, linked to these, I don't, yeah, they're all around the same time, but it seems to me that these first non-melodic, um, only rhythmic were potentially earlier than the plays. Um, so thank thank you. you. Great, let's move to the next. Uh, we have a question by Daniel and then Asaf. Uh... Yeah, um, <clears throat> I just have a comment. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, about uh, this is a regional phenomena. Um, I know that in a lot of uh, Lutheran schools in central Germany that music plays a extremely large role in the um, course schedule. I'm not sure if that's it's probably in most schools, but it, there could be a special emphasis in central Germany because of the importance of music um, in the church and Lutheranism in general. Um, I know even there are some discussions in 16th century about um, um, using music. Um, also in 16th century, not only German is sung in the churches, but they continue to sing Latin songs. And they argue that um, they wanna continue this tradition because it's useful for the school children to learn the language better by, by singing it. Um, I know that that's a very common phenomena in central Germany. Maybe there's something unique to this area. Um, this area, I live in Leipzig here, so I'm in central Germany. Um, yeah, but maybe it's, yeah, maybe it's one of the reasons why it's found in this area. Things, it's connected with the uh, Reformation. Just a comment. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much for that comment. I mean, it's certainly something that later on applies. I think the curiosity here is the early date. These first ones I have are from 1486. And the real sort of first surge of this becoming published is in 1513, 14. And someone like Cochleus who's in Nuremberg is actually quite outspokenly anti-Lutheran. Um, although he then teaches in St. Lorenz, so he's obviously still involved in the system. I think there is a real argument to be made for the continuation of this practice um, through the Lutheran Latin schools. And I mean, this is part of what I worked on also in my PhD when they, the reason they brought a lot of Italian music to Germany was actually for the Lutheran schools. You would think they might go to Catholic churches or so, but actually a lot of the, my evidence was um, coming from Lutheran regions, especially Nuremberg, obviously, but others as well, where they were singing a lot of the Latin originally composed for a Catholic um, context with exactly that argument that there was still a lot of Latin to be sung and we're finding long, long into the 16th and 17th century, a lot of Latin published for and written in, in, in Lutheran schools. So there's certainly an argument for the continuation mm -hmm. um, of this practice again locally. How far that reaches back um, is the question because these sort of start earlier than that, but they're, they, these go hand in hand. I mean, with Corvinus then also becoming someone involved in, in the Reformation. So it, they go hand in hand as something these same people appreciate. Okay, okay. Uh, one last question maybe by Asaf. Uh, th thank you very much. That was fascinating. Uh, th this is highly speculative, but could there perhaps also be a pre-Reformation German context? Um, there seems to be, um, I think of, um, let's say, of humanists and generations, people like Rudolf Agricola, or even, even Reuchlin uh, in, the, in the 1490s when he reaches Rome, uh, of, Italians, of Italians making fun of their Latin uh, pronunciation and Greek pronunciation, right? Even there's the, the backhand compliment that later German humanists uh, give Reuchlin when he meets uh, Agriopoulos, the famous scene where he said that he, he, read, he read, I think, a few passages from, uh, from Thucydides and, and he, he tried translated it accurately, that's fine, but his pronunciation was rather good for a German, and even earlier humanists, they've got these Italians constantly making fun of their, their barbarous Ita Latin. Uh, could, could perhaps a notation be um, uh, an, an attempt to, to have, you know, the, the right tilt, lilt, sorry, so to speak? No, I think that's absolutely an argument. There's also an argument I've made about these um, because it starts with Celtics, for whom pronunciation is actually a huge or I think it starts around Celtis, for whom pronunciation is a big deal. And he mentions that a lot and he wants it to be the classical pronunciation and he wants it to be and he, So I think um, pronunciation very much could be one of the starting points or anything to get them there. <laughs> it seems like <laughs> any tool is good enough. Um, but I also think it's, it's twofold. A, it seems a useful tool, it works, but also it's an, a concentrated effort to sort of show how these arts and how these are so strongly connected. And there was an argument which has actually then been forgotten for many decades or hundreds of, um, of centuries, in fact, that the classic poetry was originally sung. And we hardly ever talk about this now, or only a few people do, but I think there's also an idea behind it, maybe from Celtis, that the correct, you get there by maybe singing it. And that's also the correct way of, of um, presenting poetry. So that, that might be a third um, reason for it. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks again to our speaker for a wonderful presentation. And I also uh, thank the, 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 the others for the discussion. I, and I wonder maybe uh, whether the, the etymology of, of words like agentus and prosody also stimulated them to, to come up with these musical notes in their annotation that might also have been a factor, I don't know. But let's...